Hi everyone and welcome to another video. Today we're going to be talking about probabilistic data structures in general and we're going to be looking at one such family of data structures called Bloom filters. But before we do that, let's ask the question, what are probabilistic data structures? The formal definition is something like they provide an approximation of the answer and provide a way to approximate this estimation. A more straightforward way to look at this is to look at the memory versus running time trade-off. Simple solutions will typically strike a balance between memory and running time. Specialized solutions will often favor running time over memory. And compression solutions will do the opposite. Probabilistic data structures try to consume as little memory as possible while maintaining a reasonable running or query time. This is achievable through approximating the answer. Going back to Bloom filters, let's imagine we have a set of four items and what we're trying to do is a membership test, meaning we're trying to find out if the item F is in the set S. The simplest solution is to do a linear search over S and check each item. This works well for small sets, but with bigger sets, the problem becomes computationally expensive. One thing that we can do is to resort to a hash table or a hash set. There are many ways to create this data structure, but in its simplest form, hash sets are typically constructed from arrays where each item is hashed and placed in a specified array index. This item is often referred to as a bucket or an entry, and that depends on the specific hashing data structure. Now we can hash every item using the hash set. Since multiple items can hash to the same bucket, we have to implement a collision evasion strategy. In its simplest form, we can pick the next three items in the array. This technique is referred to as open addressing. To do a membership test, we have to use the same hashing function that was used to hash the entire set S. These tests are very efficient even with collision resolution. So what happens when we test for an item that's not in the hash set and by coincidence, we hash to an existing bucket. The array holds the original key value of the set S. So we compare the keys and if the values don't equal, we go and probe the bucket one array index down. Hash sets increase lookup performance, but they will consume large amounts of memory, especially when we cannot find an empty slot. We have to expand the array and rehash every element. Other hashing data structures that don't have this problem will typically consume even more memory. Another interesting idea that we might look at is a bit set, where each bit represents a number in a set. Now, lookup is trivial. We check if the item is set to one on a given position by the input number. We can encode all of the numbers on two bytes. This is both very fast and memory efficient. However, there's a problem. What if we had just a handful of numbers to encode, but they would have huge gaps, meaning the difference in size between the numbers is huge. Now, to encode all of the numbers, we need 105 bytes. There are ways to compress bit sets, but not all operations are possible after encoding without re-encoding the bit set. I made a separate video on bit sets, you should probably check it out. Bloom filters are a data structure that were designed to solve this problem efficiently. They combine ideas from hash sets and bit sets into a single data structure. So let's create a bit set with 32 bits in it. Now let's hash each number but instead of using a single hash function, let's use k different and independent hashing functions. For example, two. Now, each number occupies two bit sets entries. Now, 
Let's check if number 3 is present in the filter. To do that, we have to use the same hashing functions as we did for the entire set S. And if all entries resolve to 1, then element is in the bloom filter. Let's try a different number. This time, only one of two entries resolves to 1, so the number 11 is not in the bloom filter. Let's try a different number that's not in the set. This number hashed two times to 1, but hold on, we know that it's not in the filter. So what's happening here? This is where the probabilistic nature of the bloom filter manifests itself. Bloom filters can return false positives, meaning they will report having the item, but in actuality, the item is not present in the filter. This occurrence has a probability that we can compute. So far, we know that a bloom filter needs two variables to work correctly, the size of the bit mask M and K hashing functions. Let's introduce another variable called capacity or C for short. Let's explain what role each variable play in the filter. The size of the bit masks decreases the possibility of collisions and increases the encoding space. By hashing the item multiple times, we're creating a situation where collisions aren't really a problem. We are overlapping the data on the mask such that multiple numbers can occupy the same bit space. Capacity is the expected number of items that we plan to store in our bloom folder. Having all of the variables defined, we can compute the false positive error rate and for the expected capacity of 4, it's 5%. If we double the capacity to 8, the error goes up to 15%. If we continue to increase the capacity, the error will go up as well. But what happens if we add more hash functions? Can you guess? The error still goes up. Perhaps the mask is too small as is to hold this number of hash functions. Let's change it to 64 bits. This decreases the error rate, but now, if we reduce the number of hash functions, the error rate is unaffected. And again, increasing the mask size has the most significant effect on the error rate. But let's increase the number of hash functions one more time. And now, the error went down. We went through this exercise just to show you that setting these variables by hand is very difficult and there are formulas to pick the best number of hash functions and mask sizes for the bloom filter. There are even techniques that use machine learning to do parameter tuning for the filters. Let's use the formula to get the best M and K with the expected error rate of 1%. As you can see, our mask is bigger and we have more hash functions, but it's still a tiny memory footprint as compared to other data structures. Computing 7 hashes is not cheap, but it's not bad as you might think, as there are things like hashing tricks to be able to decrease the number of hash functions. But the real power of bloom filters comes from the fact that we can decide how much are we willing to sacrifice accuracy over performance in memory. If you would like to see the source code, I will post a link in the description. The source code will be in C-sharp, but you can imagine that this data structure is relatively simple to implement in any language. The code contains several improvements like the double hashing trick, which decreases the number of hashing functions to just two, and the extra hashing functions can be simply generated from this algorithm. That's all for this video. Please like and subscribe for more videos like this. Thanks and bye.